as you know, I probably don't need to tell you, app marketing is more demanding than ever. Apple is rolling back identifiers. Google is phasing out third-party cookies. It's a privacy world for consumers, and every day there's something different. It's like this ongoing, never-ending drama. And in the middle of all of that, app developers' fears that targeting may be doomed have never been higher. So we're going to deep dive into some survey numbers and a report that speaks volumes about the impact on app developers. And we're also going to look at some ways that you can find a workaround. Yes, there is a workaround. There is a way out of what seems to be the end of the world. And my guest today to tell us this and to give us a way out of the doom and despair, uh, I'll introduce my guest, Anil Mahorta. He is Chief Marketing Officer at Bango and Brett Orlansky, Senior VP Product Sales at Bango. Thanks so much for joining me, first of all. Uh, pleasure, Peggy. So Thanks, I Peggy. built you up. I built you up. You're going to show us the way out of the misery. But first, let's talk about Bango because a lot of the people in the industry, you know, it's a standard platform leading global uh, uh, leading global stores, leading, leading mobile companies choose to deliver mobile payments to everyone. Now that's where you started. Where is Bango now? Uh, let me say, let's take that, um, Peggy. So we continue to have a strong presence in that business. We have one of the leading platforms that processes currently around five, $6 billion of consumer spending on, on apps and digital content um, every year. Um, and our particular strength is powering what are called alternative payments for leading merchants and leading, leading app stores. And that really means people that want to choose a way of paying that's not putting the charge on a credit card. So uh, a lot of folks will be used to the idea of lo loading up a credit card into an app store account and charging payments through to that. But there's a growing number of people in all parts of the world for different reasons that want to choose a different payment method the most popular of which is actually using your cell phone bill, your mobile phone bill, because it's much simpler. You don't have to load anything up like credit card details. You simply tap a button and the system, the Bango system, figures out what cell network you're on and puts the charge on your phone bill. So it's really straightforward out of the box payment method, very clean, very efficient, very secure. So we do a ton of that, as I said, five, $6 billion run rate um, annually. Um, and that's still the mainstream of the business. Um, but we really started thinking um, a, a while back, a couple of years back, about what is it that's driving the revenue growth for developers selling through these app stores? Um, and we were trying to work out how we in some way could help in our position as a, as a cross-developer platform, as a, a cross-app store platform, industry-wide, global. We do Google Play payments in six different continents, for example. So how could we help app marketers sell more? And it, and it dawned on us that the one thing that we do know a lot about is how people choose to spend their money because we're processing the payments when people do choose to spend their money. So that's taken us into this additional direction. So we continue that mainstream of, of, of processing of payments using alternative payment methods, as you, as you say, Peggy. Um, but we started now really building, leveraging all, all of the insights we get out of payment processing to bring us into this whole new area, this brave new world we're going to talk about on today's podcast of purchase behavior targeting. That's a great segue because that's it. You're talking about in our new privacy conscious world, rethink strategy, adopt purchase behavior targeting. I'll ask you, Brett, what, what is this and how do marketers layer it over all that other data they have? I think a useful way to frame this product of ours, Bango audiences, is to think of it like this. 20 years ago, ads could be uh, delivered or, per, or directed towards you based on things that you searched for. 10 years ago, ads are delivered based on things that you would maybe uh, like or your social network or your social graph push towards you. Today, we can get ads delivered to you based on things that you've purchased. So that's kind of the evolution of, of the targeting uh, data. What we've done is we have this very large and constantly growing data set of purchase behavior data, things that people have made purchases of. We take this large data set, scrub it, anonymize it, segment it, hash it, and then produce an audience of users who will all have one thing in common, which is that they've made a payment in a certain type of app. So it makes sense that if you make an app 
the purchase in one app, you have a higher likelihood of making a similar purchase in a similar app. And this purchase pattern exists in all of our aspects of our life. Um, if you buy a certain type of shoe, you have a higher likelihood. Of, if you buy one shoe, you have a higher likelihood, higher likelihood of buying a similar type of shoe. Well, that same behavior manifests itself in our app behavior as well. And we have taken this product um, and made it into, excuse me, we've taken this audience data and made it into a product called the Bango Audience. This is our, our core product. And it's all based on purchase behavior data, which has never before been available. I mean, this is an exciting new data set because you make a point, Brett people who have purchased, that means they are payers, they are buyers. They don't think that content is free, entertainment is free, apps are free, things are free. They understand that things have a value and they're willing to commit to that. Um, what does this data actually allow marketers to do? One thing I was thinking off the top of my head was, this is really great because even a, an app developer that has a subscription app, for example, you still know that people will eventually pay. So that might even be an audience for them. So what does it allow them to do? What does it allow them to advance in their targeting? What are they able to net here? I'll ask you, Brett, and maybe you can chime in as well, I know. Yeah, the, um, the biggest differentiator is that we focus, a Bengal audience built on purchase behavior data focuses on payers, not players. The, the well-known adage that is very true is that 95% of users don't buy anything, 5% buy something. And the truth is it's probably much worse. I always sort of make the analogy, it's like a coffee shop. A hundred customers walk in line to get a cup of coffee, but only five buy a cup of coffee. The truth is it's much worse because those 95 that don't buy, they don't just split. They, they take a seat in your coffee shop and plug in their laptop and you know get get a free cup of water and use your restroom. They take, they consume resources. That's the point. And then you somehow have to monetize your entire coffee shop off those, off of those five cups. So if in fact you as a marketer are trying to find users and you're only marketing to a generic user base, you're going to get a lot of people that will never ever become payers. So they will never generate any revenue for you. Our hypothesis is let's focus on those audiences of people who are known payers, people who will make purchases in your product, in your app, that's going to give you better return, higher ROAS and quicker, quicker ROAS as well. That's what a product does and how it's separate from all the other ad products on the market. And, and let me answer that, Peggy. Let's go back to your original question about rethinking strategy, because that's how you, you started off coming at this question of, of what do we allow people to do with our audiences based on purchase behavior. But it does, it does require rethinking strategy. And, and, and let's be honest, there's a lot of hot air across the marketing and ad industry and, and user acquisition by ad developers and ad marketers is no different. They're in no way exempt or, or, or less prone to, to generating hot air about their activities than any other kind of marketer is. Um, and digital marketing thinking too often stops the engagement. Um, Brett talked about that idea of the evolution of what digital marketing is about from um, just looking at search behavior through to trying to trying to make a richer set of assumptions about people's propensity to, to buy based on their social media uh, conduct. And, and unfortunately, the industry kind of got stuck there. Um, and too many marketers are going back to their leadership teams and saying, hey, Look at my engagement stats. Look at the direction they go. They're all going up and all going to the right. This is fantastic. I've got more people engaging. I've got more followers. I've got people posting and retweeting. We're doing good. We're doing good. And, and the CEO, who quite honestly doesn't know any better uh, in terms of what digital marketing is about, just keeps writing out checks for marketing budgets. And, and it's not really getting anybody anywhere because fundamentally, we have to, it means we're asking, we're challenging at Bango. We're challenging the industry to rethink what, what is it doing? What are you doing it for? What is the point of digital marketing? I mean, even if you are at the stage in your, in your product life cycle where you're primarily after brand engagement through a campaign rather than an activation, you still want to target people that are likely to become customers in the end. And so you still want to think along the lines of targeting at people who are going to become purchasers. So you still need to put that logic into how you do targeting and how you think about your marketing. So. All of this guesswork in the digital marketing world around demographic profiling and psychographic profiling is two things. It's too vague and also, quite honestly, it's too intrusive as well. You know, making a bunch of assumptions about people based on their gender and their location and their habits and their social media likes. 
It's that kind of thing that when you said at the beginning, consumers are starting to ask questions about how intrusive marketing is getting. Well, I mean, at that level, it is. Um, and one of the, 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 the one of the, the cool uh, aspects about purchase behavior targeting is actually you don't really care about the personal characteristics of the individual at all. You're simply interested in finding out what they choose to spend their money on and targeting marketing at them based on that. That's all you need to know about them. So we are challenging the industry as a whole to essentially give up 10, maybe 15 years worth of preconceptions and baggage around how you do digital marketing and starting to rethink how you do it. And, you know, as in any business in any industry, it often takes a systemic jolt to the industry, which is what we're seeing now, the, the apocalypse, as Bango calls it, to force people into starting to rethink how they do things and what they do them for. Great way of getting to the topic, I have to say, guys, the cool comic book you have to make your point you know this is about growth this is about marketing this is a certain type of uh i'm gonna say demographic because we just said demographics aren't aren't the way to go but it is people who have to learn and what better way than to actually show them whose idea was it oh i guess you know the as cmo is my prerogative to uh, take the uh, take the credit for that but actually in truth it was um the whole group of people across the business talking about the ideas and uh, i should also give a shout to a very uh, cool london based agency called wildfire that we worked with who designed some of the original concepts and that, that led us to the apocalypse yeah apocalypse that was really cool and i noticed you're the scientist who saves the day brad is that telling us something here yeah, I, I like to think of myself as a as a you know mad scientist chemist. It's, it's probably a little bit of a stretch, but uh, I think they just needed some sort of like generic face to fill it in. But uh, well, I enjoyed it because when I have to do research for my podcast, it's like I'm going to read a bunch of stuff. Now this time I got to actually see a pretty cool comic book, as I said, and it's very helpful because it it paints the picture. We've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse are upon us because without the means to target ads, generate leads, advertisers. Yeah, they're having a tough time. It is a nightmare scenario, quite literally. Um, what are you actually seeing? Are budgets shifting to Android? Are they in decline? Are people coming to Bango, literally banging at the door and saying, you know, I'm falling short of my KPIs, help me. What happened? What are you seeing? The answer is all of the above. Um, we, we are seeing Android's uh, budget shift Android, that's for sure. We are seeing a lot of, I mean, but honestly, Peggy, taking a step back, it's a sort of like, there's it's not just the the condition that well, we're in at the moment it's that it's constantly changing apple makes an update to their operating system and then everyone has to retool and then react to that the overall picture is frustration and exasperation that people have been more or less successful in the past trying to reach users and then every then the rug gets pulled out from under them and then it constantly gets readjusted once you think you have your your feet your foot back on the ground um, we are seeing a lot of common co complaints that overall campaigns that have been working in the past, the performance over time is degrading and they're coming to us for something different, something new, some help that they can maybe get to, um, to get, get their campaigns back on track. And, and it's, it's nice to see that it's working that we offer do, we, we offer a product that is allows them to navigate, uh, UA campaigns that do not require IDFA, which is, you know, what's been taken away. One of the, one of our four horsemen in this apocalypse, but yeah, um, frustration, lower quality campaigns, shifting to shifting to Android, um, and then just looking for help. That's what we get a lot of people coming to us with. So we have the survey research revealed. You have it there. 59% of marketers have lost revenue since Apple's IDFE changes and the phasing out of third party cookies by Google, all the privacy changes. Was that the shocker? Is that the surprise within the data and the findings, Anil? Yeah, I think it was one of the headline surprises. I guess we uncovered that level of concern and worry amongst the app developer community. Um, <clears throat> in itself wasn't a surprise. I guess what came as a, a, a surprise to us was the scale and severity of the impact of all of these events. Uh, as you say, 60% of marketers have lost revenue um, and continue to do so, continue to see uh, their performance below where it was uh, uh, 12, certainly 18 months ago. Um, 
the the it's been a struggle because I think when, as we said before, the commercial break when people have become familiar with a pattern of of how you do targeting, how you create audiences, and, and that gets taken away from you. Um, <clears throat> People's first instinct is basically to rebuild what they had before and try to figure out other sources of, of data. And there's been, obviously the spotlight shifted quite a lot to first party data sets. Uh, the problem with, with first party data sets, of course, is they're inherently limited. Uh, and the more you harvest them, the less potency they have in terms of, um, of marketing effectiveness. And one of the things that's characterized the app economy in the last 10 or 15 years has been, has been the pace of innovation. Um, it has been the sheer speed of growth and the scale it's achieved. I mean, looking at just looking at simple analyst numbers of, of, of what amount of consumer spending is captured through through Google Play and through Apple App Store. You know, 120 billion forecast to go to 150. That's a huge chunk of consumer spending. So, on the back of that growth and spending, you've seen app developers, you've seen the whole economy become populated by uh, lots of developers from all, all parts of the world. I mean, it's, it fascinates me when we look at. The, the demand for our Bangor audiences, there's clearly strong demand in, in markets like, like USA and Europe, but, but also Turkey and Vietnam and, and Korea and places like that, where there's really healthy app developer communities. And so this whole economy, this whole digital economy, this, this app part of the digital economy has been, has been put in a shockwave. And I guess for the first time, we're going to see some, some temporary pause in the, in the relentless pace of growth that we've experienced, but but there's an existential threat here as well, because if you actually start digging into the numbers of our survey, 27%, so more than a quarter of app developers seriously think they could go out of business as a result of the changes that have happened. So if we think, you know, if the folks uh, on Capitol Hill think that the, the digital economy is important to the, to, the, to the world and to the United States, and they think the, the app economy in particular is something that, that's a, a very uh, strong growth driver, then think very carefully about, for example, new legislation. It, 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 it may well be needed, but we need to think carefully about how we roll it out because more than a quarter of the people that are driving the growth in that economy think they could go out of business. We, we looked at games developers and we saw 69% of game developers saying, and then I quote, they have no clear idea how they will continue to acquire new paying users. And out of that 69%, 20% strongly agreed, strongly agreed that this was their single biggest problem. So one in five, single biggest problem is how do I acquire new paying users? So, so it's, it's seismic actually, the, 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 the changes going on. I think, you know, I'm surprised in some respects that before this Bango report, we haven't seen these data points, but this, the Bango report produces these data points and crystallizes them in a form that's that's um, undeniable for the first time. Now, suddenly it's okay as an app marketer is what I learned and, and saw in the industry. It's okay to say, yes, I'm worried because we all, are, we all need to look very, very confident and we've got this, but it's not just the changes to your point as well, Brett, it's the pace of the change. We can adapt to change, but not all of this different change. And now with um, Google privacy uh, sandbox, you know, it's just, don't know what's going on. There's no clarity and it's all very uncertain. But one thing that you made very clear in your report and you call them the zombie users, you say the goal is to reach the unreachable users. You need to bring them back to life. Great analogy, zombie users. But how do marketers go about doing this? Can you give me some actionable first steps? The first step is to recognize that what you've been doing in the past hasn't been working or, or what won't work anymore, I should say. Right, that you can't use these users are, can't be found using the old methods. So let's adapt. Um, using purchase behavior targeting is the core method that we advocate for. Uh, once you have adopted, once you've um, accepted that this is going to be one of the strategies you can use, we actually offer four specific tips that you can use to um, to reach these clients. The first is by looking at by targeting apps that are very, very similar to yours. So when I say similar, I don't just mean like in the same category, get granular, often can target your competition, folks that you actually see in your competition. The next sort of rung out in a, in a concentric circle is you could think about, it turns out that there are correlations, be, uh, certain non-obvious correlations between certain app categories that uh, like trivia game players will also play bingo games. Um, you can see this kind of correlation amongst the data that 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 we we've been able to see 
that there are categories of apps that are not your necessary necessarily your categories, but are, are adjacent and you can target them. That's the next rung out. The third rung out from the categories um, is that some of those corollary categories are high value. Not all of them are creative equal. And there's a few categories that are especially high value that have pockets of really, really high paying users. And if you have those uh, correlations, or if you can identify these correlations, then you're in, you're in good shape because you can target those users in those high value categories. And the fourth and final sort of step is to really use the organic lift that you're going to get uh, in real world activity. The best example of this is, uh, you know, everyone knows that in January, health and fitness apps and, and that kind of thing generally skyrockets. But it turns out that in July, more subscriptions are, are purchased for health and fitness. It doesn't mean more apps are installed, or more apps are installed, but more people are making purchases in July in health and fitness. So this is the kind of data that you can tease out or trends you can tease out by looking at purchase behavior targeting to find those zombie users. How would I actually, or how would a marketer rather, really start to get the most of Bango audience. You talk about different data. Is there a, a bunch of reports? Do you have some sort of um, university or tutorials to help people get the most out of it? Because you made some great points there. It's not just the purchase data, but when you layer that over what you know about audiences or what you know about your competition or those categories that are very, very similar that you can aim therefore for similar results. There's a lot to digest there. How is Bango making this digestible? The easiest way is, you know, come work with us. Uh, you know, we, we, we obviously, this is our product. This is sort of our wheelhouse. Uh, but I think that once an advertiser commits to looking at the purchase data, they can also find similar trends on their own. Knowing what to look for is I think really helpful in this and a good starting point. What I would advocate for is to look for patterns of similar purchases. And then once you've identified buckets of users that make a similar category type purchase, try to identify what the non-obvious correlations are. Don't just think that if you make, uh, if you're in social casino, for example, as a category of app, that if you play poker apps, then you will also play solitaire apps just because they're two card games. That's too obvious. There are other ones that, um, that you can look for. And you can start with the data that we have published. Um, that we've made available in white papers on our site and uh, and in, in various presentations like the one I gave last week at, at MAL in Las Vegas. So there are starting points that you can use to find pockets of data. Yeah, we do We do on Bango. Bango.ai is the specific website that really has all of the tools and information that you're going to want. Um, <clears throat> there's some good stuff. There's some interesting stuff on there. There's some case studies on there that Brett and the team have, have created and put up. Um, there's also some some advice on, on how to think about it. We have a great customer services team, customer success team that will that will help people out to get to get going to try out um, using Bango audiences and look at what what make, it makes sense to measure because you want to think about measurements differently. As I was saying uh, at the top of the program, when you're when you're focused on per buying users, you want to think about your measurements differently as well. So we, we've got some good resources that people should try. But it's it's um, well, I, I should also add, I, th I think at least it's a comparatively inexpensive investment to start thinking about targeting your your campaigns using Bango audiences. Um, given the return on investment you're going to get, it's 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 a shrewd it's a shrewd investment to make especially in these turbulent times. So you said it yourself, um, and I have to follow up therefore, what is the range? How affordable is this for developers? The model that we use, uh, that we, we feel is, is well understood and recognized in the industry is a percentage of your ad spend that you use against a bingo audience. And the starting point is 10%. And our theory, our, our notion is that if we could bring you 10% improvement in ROAS, then it's in your interest, you the app developer to continue. And almost always we, we blow that out of the water. It, it's, it's a high bar to begin with, but we're almost always very successful. Um, and as your ad spend goes up with us, our rates go down, but it starts at 10% and goes down from there. I want to stop for a moment by looking into the future. We've talked about how you navigate this privacy first world talked about the ways, the workarounds, and how I get started, how I can use audience data, how marketers can use audience data. What do you see ahead? What will marketers need to be navigating ahead? What's ahead for them? I'll start with you, Brett, and finish with you, Anil. I think that the trend, you know, to, to torture the analogy, you don't want to go where the puck is, you want to go where it's going, is making, making do with less. 
and uh, less data, less tracking, less insight, the, the move away from deterministic to probabilistic, uh, that's sort of where where things are going. So let's let's follow that plan. Um, and I guess the, the the way that our approach has been is to look at large data sets and find trends. That always that uh, that isn't always necessarily available to everybody, but that is I think the right general method. Try to analyze large data sets to find the trends that are relevant for you uh, using purchase behavior targeting. I think that is the the general course that uh, that we that we see. Uh, I'm I'm tracking along the view that um, we need to we need to rethink um, what what advertising should look like from our point of view as advertisers and marketers, and actually from our customers' point of view. I think the easy accessibility of advertising through digital media through digital platforms means that we just fired out just gallon after gallon after gallon of, 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 of uh, dubious marketing, quality marketing content with questionable quality creation, because it's just easy to put it out. It's very, very simple to put ads out on digital platforms. So the world is swimming in advertising. The world does not need more advertising, that's for sure. What is it about? And I think it's it's, we used to think of consumers as passive. We used to think of consumers as people that will be respond, will respond to our advertising, either in some way that is qualitative through brand, brand extension and brand presence, or through some way that's quantitative through activation. And then we have our sales, our activation sales funnel. Um, and I wonder whether we ought to start thinking of the consumer as more active in that relationship, because if it is the case that consumers are going to assert more control over their data and, and how their data is used and who has access to their data. That signals to me the idea of a relationship, more of a relationship, because the consumer is starting to starting to say, "This is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. This is what I want to hear about." Um, so I think advertisers and marketers need to think about that as a relationship, and really, the relationships that are meaningful are ones where there's an exchange of value. There's a product or service I'm offering. You're willing to pay me for it. Um, as somebody wiser than I said. The ultimate proof of brand engagement is somebody's willingness to spend their money on your product or service, not somebody's willingness to like it or re repost it. And so I think when we start thinking about that, it could be the case in five years time that we do less advertising. Shock. You know, we actually do less, post less adverts than we did before. But the better advertising is better targeting advertising. And it's more rewarding commercially for us as businesses and experientially for our customers. And as you said yourself, purchase is like part of that, not just closing the funnel, it's um, it's showing that there's brand love, brand preference. Uh, it's already a symbol, it's a, it's a sign of my behavior and picking up on that perhaps makes it more precise from the get-go, more effective certainly. I want to thank both of you for joining me today and sharing this and also showing that although you have a very dramatic name for your report, the apocalypse, there is a workaround, there is a way out of it. Thanks again, Brett and Anil for sharing and being on my show today. Thank you, Peggy. And we will survive the apocalypse. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. It's not as bad as it seems. It's not as dire. There is a way out. In the meantime, of course, if you want to keep up with me throughout the week, find out more about how you can be a guest or sponsor, you can email me, Peggy. Peggy at mobilegroove.com is where you'll also find my portfolio of content marketing and app marketing services. So until next time, remember, every minute is mobile. So make every minute count. Keep well, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.